Welcome to this brief introduction to ERP systems. So it's helpful to think of ERP systems in a historical context. Imagine that we have a company making widgets. We have a sales team, we have a manufacturing team, we have accounting, we have administrators trying to watch over the whole process. Now if you think about how a firm develops its IT systems over time, they generally start in some place like accounting. And accounting handles lots of data, they have to deal with a lot of different issues with data, with generating a lot of different reports, so they're typically one of the first users of information technology. So in our example, we have a widget producing factory here. The accountants may choose a system, you know, like Excel at the simple end, or something like QuickBooks at the top end, that fits their needs. Right? So we have QuickBooks. Now QuickBooks has its own little pool of data, its own application, its own interface. Meanwhile, however, our sales department also wants to use technology. So they're going to go ahead and they find the system that best, best fits their needs. And then our operations, our widget factory, is going to find some sort of scheduling system. Now over time, we start to realize as an organization that we have a lot of duplication here. I mean, why are we inputting someone's name here and then re-inputting it here and then re-inputting it here? And so we start transmitting data from one system to another system through interfaces. Right? The idea that you have these pathways where data goes from point A to point B to point C. These interfaces are well defined. So we say, here's how the data is going to come out of our sales system and go into our operations system. And then conversely, going from operations into our accounting system. However, this lends to problems, right? This is it's called batch processing because the system gets transferred in batches, right? So maybe once a week we transfer data from here to here, you know, and once a day transfer from here to here. And we end up with lots of different legacy systems, right? Sales has a system that works for them, they've been using it for years, they don't want to change. Right? Maybe the manufacturing company that did our operations system was gone out of business. Or the programmer we hired for our accounting system has quit or retired off to the Bahamas somewhere. So over time we end up with a brittle system. Right? Anytime something changes in one of these systems, it may or may not cause problems down the line. So say we have a customer with a very long last name, maybe 20 characters in the last name. This system can handle it, but perhaps this system can't. Right? And so we don't really know those systems until we upgrade something, or we change the manufacturing system, and we find that it requires a different format for its data. And also want it copy out accounting data in the way we've expected it to be. So we end up with a very brittle system over time. This also is costly in terms of opportunity costs. Right? Once you buy these systems, generally they don't cost much, except if you start counting things like having to deal with poor intelligence, right? Management asked information, all right, well, in one, one point in time, how much money do we have in the system? They want to look at all different systems at one place. How do they find out with the current three batch systems we have in place now? They can't do that. We also have issues with maintenance. Over time, hiring programmers that can work on our old COBOL system for operations gets more and more expensive. So we lose some things. We lose flexibility. We lose the ability to have data go from one point to the other point seamlessly. So one of the ways that companies are reacting to this is by having ERP systems, right? Enterprise Resource Planning. The idea is we have one single common database that serves different areas. So all the data, whether you're in sales, whether you're in accounting, whether you're in manufacturing, all sits in this central database. And there's some really good features about this because we now know that if someone gets input into the database, it's in one place. And if you fix their name here, it gets fixed everywhere, no matter if it's sales doing it, or accounting doing it, or operations doing it. Management also likes this because now they can see all the different systems in one point in time. We do things like dashboards or key performance indicators. So it makes it a lot easier to manage the data. Now there's some things if we think about this that advantages turn into disadvantages. Right? So we have pools development cost. Right? The idea here is that you hire one software company and that one software company makes systems for a lot of different companies. So instead of everyone building their own copy of Microsoft Word, we now have Microsoft doing it for us and saves each individual company a lot of money. But that directly leads to lack of differentiation. If we all use Microsoft Word, now our office systems are no longer a source of differentiation for our business. Similarly, it requires best practices. Right? Microsoft decides what's the best way to create a document. Well, perhaps that best way of making a document doesn't really fit our organization, in which case it's too bad. We have to redesign our organization, BPR, Business Process Redesign. 
So it reduces our cost, but it also reduces our flexibility. Right? It increases our standardization, but it also means that we might have some subsystems that are not quite optimal. Imagine if you're the accounting department. You love QuickBooks, it works well for you, but then the management comes in and says, hey, we're all going to go ahead and standardize on this ERP system. It works for sales, it works for manufacturing, and it sort of works for accounting, but it's not nearly as easy to use for you. This is one of those times when you, as an organization, you're going to assume some trade-offs. You're going to say, well, it's not great for accounting, but manufacturing loves it, so we're going to go with this system. You have end-to-end -end reporting, but it requires you as an organization to be a lot more disciplined. Right? We have to agree on our data. You know, what does it mean to ha say someone's a customer? What kinds of financial data do we need on our customers? What kinds of reporting do we need to create? What kinds of standardized labels do we need to decide upon? So it requires, as a company, you become more disciplined. Right? And so it increases control, right? which could be good, it could be bad. depends on how good your management systems are and how happy people are to be closely managed. Let's look at the implementation timeline. We can roughly group it into four different parts. Right? We have some sort of upfront piece. We decide in advance how we're going to do our systems. Some sort of implementation phase where things all kind of go to pot. Stabilization phase where things will get a little better and then some sort of continuous improvement. Right? And this is typically a long process. It's very easy just to buy the software. It's very hard to reshape the organization to make it work for you. So here's some standard issues you run into. So in the initial design phase, you're really shifting your mindset of how data are owned. Right? Before you had different pots of data. Right? This is the sales data, this is accounting data, this is manufacturing data. After the design phase, you move into sort of a river mindset. Data doesn't really belong to any one organization or one piece of the organization. Instead, it belongs to everybody. So you have to agree, how are we going to say about this data? Right? How do we decide how to record things? How do we decide what data you need? How do we decide how, how well to validate data? Because now you have sales inputting data and it's being used by other people. We have issues with customization. Right? Most systems allow you to tweak things like labels and categories, but it may be that certain companies have unique processes and they have to decide up front are we going to allow everyone to change the system? Or are we going to allow third-party systems? Do we go back to some part of that batch system where we have different pieces that all have to talk to each other? And lastly, we have to decide how we're going to change our processes to match what the software wants us to do. Right? Again, these things kind of get tied together. How much do we want to do what the software wants us to do, and how much do we customize it? Next, we have our implementation phase. This is typically underestimated in terms of disruptiveness in the business. If you've ever been through an ERP change, it's typically not a lot of fun. You find out things like software bugs. Right? You find out the data is not being transferred properly. You find out things like people don't always agree on what it means to actually close a sale. It's very difficult. And so this is where change management really comes in handy. There's whole classes on this, how to manage projects, how to manage change. But it's really difficult because it's telling people how to do their jobs. Then we have stabilization, right? These are where we start fixing all these sort of things we've discovered during this disruptive implementation phase. Right? We find bugs in the software, we do cleaning on our data. And lastly, hopefully, we get to the improvement phase. And this is where people generally were selling you and back here in the design phase, hey, we can accomplish this if we just do the software. This is where we finally get to do things like matrix organizations, improving your intelligence, doing new features, but you can't do this stuff until you fix the bugs, you clean the data, you decide how to customize things, you go through all the disruptive implementation phase. So a couple of keys to success. One of the major keys to success is simply change management. If you think about an organization, it's very difficult to tell someone who's been doing a job for 15 years that they're going to have to change what they do. You have to go into people's jobs too and redefine what they mean. Previously your job might have been to generate, maintain, and report on data. But now with an ERP system, that job might be redundant. So now you have to retrain people into do a new position, new new bosses. You know, now instead of just inputting data for your boss, you're inputting data for sales, for manufacturing, for HR, and now you're really opening yourself up to have to increase the amount of discipline in your organization. Metrics are really key to success. Saying in advance what are the goals of this process are really, really important. If you think back to the different phases of the project, you have the design phase. Everyone's happy, we're all working well together. 
things typically start going badly during implementation. It takes us quite a while, you know, upwards of a year or more, to get back to where we were at the beginning of this process. By this time, you're tired of the project, people aren't happy with each other, and things are going better, but there's so much bad blood that's been spilled and so much debt in this part of the project that it's sometimes hard to remember that things have actually gotten better. So it's very helpful if you can decide in advance what are our goals. It could be things like, uh, like ROI. It could be things like how long it takes for an order to be processed. Right? But decide in advance what are our goals for this process. And our goals for process are to reduce the time and reduce the maintenance cost. But if you can decide in advance, then at this stage, it's very, very helpful to know that you're actually getting somewhere. It also helps people focus right? during this whole stabilization phase. You decide what are the critical issues, right? What's just a cosmetic thing? You know, this field is before that field, and what's really hurting the business and costing you money. It's very useful to begin in advance to decide what's the goal during this phase. Last one is just management commitment. If you think about all the change management issues that are going on in this process of changing people's jobs and increasing discipline of organization. It's very, very important that CIO, CEO, COO, different people are really committed to this new way of designing the company. Changing the, the focus of this is, is really, really difficult, and it's good to decide in advance to make sure that you have senior management commitment. So I hope that was helpful in providing a brief introduction to ERP systems. And these are very, very good systems. You can do a lot of very good things with an organization and becoming more disciplined sharing data better and reducing redundancies. But they are difficult in terms of redesigning the organization. They reduce the flexibility of the firm by locking you into sort of a best practice approach. And it can reduce your differentiation if you're not careful about it. But ultimately, it's a very effective tool that is difficult to implement, but it has some significant rewards as well.